Well, folks, this is episode number six of seven on our topic that Shane Mahoney and I have been discussing about wild harvest. And in this one, we talk about something that's undeniable, and that is the economic realities of wild harvest, the economic contributions that are made, but also what would be the economic consequences without wild harvest. In this case, we can think about excise taxes, license fees, how conservation gets funded, how food gets procured, and what is the economic benefits of that. We can go into a lot more about the economic benefits of all this. And we do touch on a lot of it here in episode number six. So I hope you're enjoying these. I hope you'll share them if you like them. And on this one, pay good attention because I think you're gonna find that if hunting were to go away, the funding for conservation, the funding for wild harvest would also go away. Now we get into a little bit of my arena, Shane. We're gonna maybe touch on some numbers, economics as the tax accountant guy like I am. This you, stuff, oh, I you. can nerd out on this kind of stuff. Well, great, I'd like to see you nerd out. <laughs> 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 Well, be an experience the, worth remembering, I suspect. <laughs> well, I'm I'm always worried because in the accounting space we have a, a statement when we think somebody's stretching the truth, we say figures lie and liars figure. Yeah. And uh, I don't want to be that. Either of that. No. Well. So, <laughs> I, the the models we have, the way that conservation gets funded, really has made a big economic difference and maybe it's best to just start touching on some of the funding mechanisms and mm -hmm. the scope and the size and, and how that came to be. Well, I mean, I think first of all, it's interesting to point out that these major tax-based funding uh, mechanisms that have been developed in the United States such as Pittman-Robertson funding, Dingle Johnson, Wallop Rowe, and so on. Uh, they are, of course, exclusive to the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Even though Canada and the United States are conjoined philosophically and in many cases legislatively and in terms of policy development generally, uh, they've been aligned under the aegis of the North American model. There is a significant difference between the two countries with respect to how wildlife is sort of in quotation marks paid for. Yeah. So if we look at, you know, the famous Pittman-Robertson Act, which was brought in in 1937, mm -hmm. and we looked at the amount of money that has been acquired through excise taxes on ammunition and Fire sh arm. firearms, etc., you know, we see an amount of money somewhere uh, in excess of 15 billion, and maybe moving towards even 18 billion at the present time, mm -hmm. since it was incepted in, in uh, 1937. And if you look at the Dingle Johnson process which came about in about 1950, you're looking at something uh, that's in the neighborhood of about nine million, nine billion, billion. I'm sorry, yeah. cumulatively. Right. So you're looking at something, and that was of course based uh, around fishing, fishing primarily, and yeah. fishing products and tackle and mm -hmm. boats and so on. Um, so when you look at those two combined, you're actually looking at something, you know, that sums up to about $24 billion that was actually made available through excise taxes on the purchase of equipment that are used to harvest wildlife and, of course, to acquire wild food. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what really we are talking about because there's a small percentage of hunting that may not lead to the acquisition of wild food, but it's very small. Yeah. And the vast majority is about this um, harvesting of food. So in a way, you can look at this, this through the lens of the, of the Wild Harvest Initiative and say, as far back as 1937, the United States of America was finding a way to raise more money to conserve wildlife that people would harvest, and a fundamental value in that equation was, of course, they would they would harvest this uh, this food for this wildlife for food purposes. What they were most concerned about, of course, and this is the same with Wallop Bro and Dingle Johnson, they were most concerned with providing money for conservation activities for the species in question, right. for, for research and policy development and habitat work and so on and so forth. Um, and they weren't necessarily making the leap that this was a, you know, a funding mechanism to support 
uh, while foraging or while harvesting, but you can see how the circle mm -hmm. completes itself. What they invested in in the wildlife populations became, therefore, the possibilities and the potential from which the hunter and angler drew their catch and their harvest, and then that was where the food, of course, derived. But of course, in the United States, in addition, while Canada does not have a Dingle Johnson, Walla Bro kind of taxation, it does not have a Pittman Robertson kind of designation or delegation of money. Uh, and most of the money comes from what we call general revenue that comes through general taxation to the government, which provides some of that back. And some of that happens in the United States, but it's not a predominant source. Very, 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 small, very, very, very small amount of money happens in that particular case. Um, but what you also have to realize about <clears throat> this economics of harvesting and the economics of conservation in the United States is that the, the federal taxation systems, while powerful and regular and, of course, dependable to some extent, um, they are not by any means the only very significant funding mechanisms that derive, that are outside of government, for example. So the individual hunter and angler in the United States, when you purchase you know, a fishing license or a hunting permit or whatever, that money is then dedicated to the state agencies for the work on those populations as well. And that's a large amount of money. There's 12 and a half million uh, engaged right now in the... Uh, in the hunting, and there's a lot more than that engaged fishing. in recreational fishing. So this generates a substantial amount of money. Now, normally the, the, the conversation ends there. Normally people talk about licensing and permitting allocations, and they talk about these federal taxation systems, which all do provide their money on some formula back to state agencies based on a geographic size, population of people you know, that, that are there, and so right. forth. But what's not included in those equations is, are the very large amounts of money uh, and other resources that are raised by uh, focused groups within the hunting and angling communities, the people who create the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundations of the world. The people who create, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Wild Sheep Foundations and National Wildlife Federations and the Mule, uh, Mule Deer Association or Mule, Mule Deer Foundation or Whitetails Unlimited or uh, Dallas Safari Club. You can go across the spectrum, Ducks Unlimited, et cetera. Right. And when you sum all of those up, uh, and some of them have chapters or affiliates or offices or offshoots uh, working in uh, Canada, but the bulk of them and the richest uh, diversity of them actually reside and exist and were born in the United States of America, they collectively raise additional massive amounts of money that are provided for various conservation programs, many of which benefit species that ultimately are harvested for food. Right. So we already have, and this was a point we made earlier in this discussion, while we are striving to introduce a new conceptual framework for thinking about wildlife and wildlife conservation through a food lens, if you will, and looking at landscapes that way, I mentioned that we have a lot of things already in play that in a way are already in support of this. Yeah. And so when you start to think about it from a, um, a wild harvest initiative perspective, all of these kinds of funding mechanism, mechanisms that exist in the United States are already in support of, in a sense, the wild <laughs> harvesting that is occurring, even yes. though that's not primarily what they were, right. what they were designed to do. <clears throat> and um, the end result of this, of course, is that um, there has always been uh, a, a very large swath of resources in the United States to hire people, to engage discussions, to dream of ideas, to find ways of implementation. And that whole dynamic, you know, if it spins on a big wheel in the United States of America, and it spins on a much considerably smaller one in Canada, and perhaps even a smaller one again in Mexico. Yeah. But um, the economics, of course, when we talk about all of these things, the money that's available for conservation, there's also another economy that is running around this, 
And that's the economy that all of this activity generates itself, which <laughs> is the economy, the outward economy, if you will, the economy for, for travel and the purchase of gas and vehicles and, you know, forerunners and, and uh, quads and boats and raw, you know, all of that, which is, they're all bought from somebody. Yeah. And then, of course, the accommodations where hunters go and visit certain places or fishermen go there to stay and so on and so forth. <clears throat> In the United States of America, the amount of money spent on providing for hunting dogs is an absolutely astounding figure. Really? It is, it is so large, I will leave you to discover it, partly because I can't give it to you accurately, <laughs> but I know it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars wow. are spent on, on hunting dogs, on hunting dogs. <laughs> all their food, all their kennels, vet care. all their vet care, uh, <laughs> you know, all of these kinds of things. I mean, it's, it's, it's just an absolutely massive industry in and of itself. And again, that's all of these things are providing a massive wildlife economy, if you will, that on its fringes, of course, also includes bird watching and bird feeding and yeah. kayaking and hiking. All and of that. All of these kinds of things. And so the bottom line is that nature everywhere, but nature in America in particular, nor in, in the United States of America, is, uh, is just a formidable engine of commerce. And then when you add your protected areas and your national parks and the visitations to all of those and your, your, your state parks and your municipal parks and all these kinds of things, you begin to suddenly realize that, okay, what would happen if all of a sudden all of this goes away? We don't have wildlife. We don't have scenic uh, places to go. Um, you know, where, do, where does all that economy go? Well, it, well, it, 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 it dribbles down the drain. Uh, that's where it goes. And you end up with a circumstance now where the 600,000 or so uh, jobs in rural America that are generated by hunting and related activities all of a sudden are not there anymore. Right. Now imagine the social circumstances if 600,000 people did in fact lose their livelihoods in rural America. Yeah. Think of the social and political yeah. upheaval that would result from this. So that would be... We have a... We have an economic juggernaut. And then, of course, you think about all of the industries that are providing into this system. The optics companies, the ammunition companies, the yeah. firearm companies, the clothing, clothing boots, companies. Backpacks, uh, yeah. just, the list goes on this and is on. A, this, is, this is a massive industry. And, of course, it's a massive industry uh, that has to be seriously considered because of the benefits it brings to society like any industrial complex does. It generates wealth, it provides salaries and employment and so on and so forth. It ends up, of course, giving money to philanthropic causes and so on and so forth in various and different ways. It generates a whole artistic community, all of the wildlife artists who make their way in this country right. and other places, uh, feeding into this kind of psychological uh, acceptance, this, this, this already created group of customers who are eager for that kind of art and that kind of furniture and that kind of jewelry and that kind oh, of yeah. go on and on and on and on. And so when most people think about wildlife uh, and all of these things of harvesting and visiting wildlife, wanting to see wildlife and so on and so forth, they don't really think about all of these moving parts but all of these moving parts are absolutely integral. And now we are going to add into this potent mix, we are going to add this idea of wild food, quantified, valuated, described, accessible, and on the basis of all that, try to encourage policymakers to rethink how they look at the land so that these numbers that we're talking about can even be increased Mm -hmm. More people will buy firearms and fishing rods and canners. They think oh, of all yeah, that, that stuff, right? I mean. Spices, barbecuers, <laughs> grinders, all these kinds of things. Uh, we really can create a much bigger nature-based economy than we currently have in this country and in Canada. And we should get on with doing just that. Yeah, I'm, I'm fully on board with that. I, I've often asked myself... 1937, the Dirty Thirties, 
the Dust Bowl, the, I mean, the depression of a, a global yes. depression. And along comes a group of people, the hunters and shooters, who said, we'd like an 11% excise tax. Yeah. How remarkable was that in the context of the time? Yeah. And I've often said, would our current generation stand for that? Or would they, would they repeal it if they had the chance? Or say it didn't exist, would they ever support it if it came forward? Yeah. Well, in the last two weeks, we have had federal legislation trying to repeal that. Mm -hmm. And it has been a complete avalanche of comments. Do not touch that. Yep. And it has been so refreshing for me as kind of a, a referendum, if you want to call it, on where we are at in our support of funding conservation in the United States. Every one of our non-governmental organizations our corporate groups, our, our business groups, our rank and file individuals, the, the lobbying groups that represent our industries are on Capitol Hill right now saying, whose idea was this? Yep. Nobody wanted this. This has done so much good. Yep. And it's been really uplifting for me yeah. to see kind of this chance to restate our commitment yep. to how we are willing to pay whatever it takes mm -hmm. to keep that wild landscape producing yeah. and, and available to us. Yeah, we have to remember, of course, th there was no great you and cry to bring this in by the hunters right at the time. Right. But nevertheless, there was no great you and cry to prevent it either or it probably wouldn't right. have happened. And the, the, the ammunition uh, uh, manufacturers, both for long rifles or for you know, hunting rifles, as well as for shooting, uh, weaponry, um, you know, they had mixed feelings about it. I think, I think your con conjecture about differences in time, in time, like would it happen today? How would we deal with it today? I think is a very positive thing to see this kind of reaction that is coming forward. Whether we would instigate the, right. the, the you know, the tax at this day and age, I doubt. Right. And, I, and I doubt that because the politics of the country has changed right. so much. And in the case of um, Pittman-Robertson and in the case of Dingle Johnson and Wallop Rowe, I think in every case they were bipartisan yep. uh, efforts together uh, where Democrat and Republican worked side by side because they believed in this. And I think what we saw at that time from the 1930s into the 1950s when much of this happened you still had people who had come to political office in America who had direct life experience with these activities, mm -hmm. with farming, with, with being on the land, with hunting and with fishing, and had come from generations of people who had done those kinds of things. And I think they carried with them a, a really fundamental sense of feeling and an emotional attachment to these activities that I'm not sure exists to the same extent in the elected bodies we have today. I, that's pure I, conjecture on no, my part. No, that's not I don't conjecture. Know. That's fact. Yeah. I, yep. uh, I get to go to Washington, D.C. Yep. Uh, yep. Regularly, I interact with uh, plenty of our elected leaders. Yep. Uh, and it's a very small handful of them that yep. are connected to wild landscapes the way we are. Yeah. If there it would make people, sense. Yeah. yeah uh, I guess to that point is when you walk the halls of Congress, you, and those of them that are connected the way that we are, make sure that even if you're not from their state, Randy, you know, yep. come, let's, let's talk hunting. Yep. And so it's, yep. it is refreshing to see that there are, are still some of them there. But yeah, the composition and the, the connection is now quite removed from the landscape and the production of food yep. in our governing bodies. Yep. It just is the reality of it. Yep. So in your... Uh, <clears throat> In what Wild Harvest Initiative is doing, do you think we'll get to the point where we would be able to put, a, and I say this with some hesitation where there's so much more value to the wild harvest and to the wild experience and, and to the wild places that I, I ask this question with a little bit of hesitancy, but would we ever be able to put a value on what that wild harvest is in terms of a dollar amount. This many pounds of elk 
if you went to buy it, not that you can buy elk in the U.S., yeah. but or if you went to replace it with a similar quality of food at that yeah. quantity, or a similar amount of mushrooms, or you know, wild asparagus, or whatever the the yeah. forage item is, or or with you know whether you want to say farm fish or or the the sea cot fish, do you think we could? When you accumulate all that, do you, do you see where eventually a dollar number would be put on that? Because that's a lot of times what the, the policymakers listen to. Well, we are doing just that. We, we've started with the first two years of data that we had, and we've explored where are all the databases that we could possibly use to come up with what we call equivalency values for okay. this particular food. So we're a long, long way down that road. And we looked at the the systems and indices that are available in Canada and in the United States. And we also checked the European indices just to see if there was something uh, a little easier to use in Europe. So we will definitely come out with a an economic value on by species and in total wow. of all of this food that is harvested. And then ultimately where this is going to go, you know, we have this biomass of harvest we are going to be linking all of this with a full economic valuation of hunting because for the first time we'll have the food value in there. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go over exactly these kinds of points that we provided for to guide us through this series of discussions. Um, we will be looking at a renewed uh, sense of uh, economics with respect to hunting and angling in this country, um, including, as I said, the value of, of the meat. And then what we are going to do is we're going to say, as, as one of the final deliverables on this project, which will is about two to three years out now, is going to be, okay, here are all the statistics. Uh, this is how much we harvest. Uh, this is uh, what it's worth. This is how many meals it generates. You know, all these statistics are there. Um, this is how much of this food is actually shared and with so, how many people it is shared and so on and so forth. We're going to have all that. This is the amount of money that's generated out of these kinds of activities. We'd had to be careful there to make sure that we differentiated between shooters and hunters right. in terms of the, those monies, but that can be done relatively easily. <clears throat> and then what we're going to propose is the counterfactual. So what we're going mm -hmm. to say, say at that point in time, okay, here it is. I'm drawing a zipper or a black line under all we've done in the last seven years with respect to this. And now I'm going to put on one bleak black question up there on that screen. What would happen if all of this went away? Yeah. So you start taking each of these issues, like the funding for wildlife, like the advocacy for wildlife, like the uh, lives and existences of all of those non-governmental communities, like the structure of what your state and federal agencies would look like, like how is the government of every state going to now pay for the conservation of wildlife, for example, as a result of this? How is this amount of wild food going to be replaced? Because now you're going to want to eat more pigs, or you're going to want to eat more chickens, or you're going to want to eat more, more things of this nature. And that's where we'll also start to look at you know, other scenarios. Well, some people might say we'll all become vegetarian. Well, the truth of the matter is that there's a pretty strong sense in my mind that uh, not all of the United States of America is going to go vegetarian. <laughs> but even if they did, we could, you know, figure out what that would look like. And I think that counterfactual is going to be the ultimate delivery of the Wild Harvest Initiative. Um, it's going to bring, for the first time, the fully integrated valuation of hunting and angling and other foraging prospects in this country uh, into a quantified model that people are going to be able to relate to directly. We're going to be able to describe for the first time what would happen if that went away, even leading right on down to predictions of what would happen to wildlife populations when the funding for habitat management, for example, goes away and when there isn't money to do sheep uh, translocations and so on and so on. Yeah. And there isn't the concern about whether domestic and wild sheep overlap and we just let all of that run its course until, you know, most of the wild sheep are dead yeah. and so on. It has taken us 40 to 50 years to restore wild sheep to even a portion of the range that they occupied historically. Um, and if we fall back from that, then the task is going to become just com absolutely enormous. So ultimately, what this is going to create, if you will, in my mind, is almost kind of the doomsday scenario, wow. the day of wildlife is over, 
in the United <laughs> States of America and Canada. And the day of all of these cultures that are associated with it are also all over because either the government stands up federally and statewise and says, we're going to take a huge amount of money from all kinds of other social services to put into this activity, which I don't which think they will happen. And in some cases, the states simply would not have the wherewithal to do it right. anyway. Um, and then at the same time, you know, once you see these traditions being lost, after they're lost for a certain point in time, no matter how much it matters to us, after a while when traditions are lost, people don't necessarily fight to bring them back after a long period of time. It's just the way it is. It's just the way we adapt as human beings to circumstances. So we are, we're on the tip of creating something, I believe, that's, in, that's explosive. Uh -huh. It's not only going to encourage us in what we are doing today. It's not only going to be the only chance we have, and again I stress, this is the only chance we have, this wild food domain, to keep hunting with us. Nothing else will withstand the constant whiplash and storms and hailstones and tensions and litigation and criticisms and all of that that affects everybody in this space already today. Yeah. From young children going to school who can become embarrassed that they hunt because so many of their friends may not do it and all of that social change that is going on. You know, without something like this that ties it to food, that renormalizes hunting in the United States of America and in Canada, not just in Montana, where it's already right. pretty normal, yeah. but, but there have been other places where it's been pretty normal, and it's not as normal now as it used to be. Mm -hmm. And that can happen here, too. If anybody thinks that it can't happen here, right. they're absolutely wrong. You know, they're smoking way too much of a, 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 of a good herb, you know, if, 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 they, if, they, if they really believe that they cannot lose what, what they have. Because believe me, I come from Newfoundland and I know what can be lost. Right. You've seen loss. Of, I've, we've so. seen loss. I and mean, I know how it happens. And it's a strange and painful process to, uh, to view. So I think we're not only talking about here with the Wild Harvest Initiative, you know, about this question of how much wild food and all of that. But as your questions have led into, Randy, it opens up this whole world of what will be the future if we do not have these activities of hunting and angling and so on. And what will be the circumstances for nature? What will be the circumstances for human beings? What will be the circumstances for our, our community economies? Yeah. What will be the circumstance for our landscapes? And now we come all the way back to this idea of one health. If we cannot have these healthy landscapes for wildlife, we cannot have these healthy landscapes for people. And if we want to have a nation of healthy, happy, free people, that's a great thing. If we want to have a nation of less happy, less free, less contented people, I think that's a pretty poor second choice. Yeah. And I don't think there's any way to have the former the happy, free, vibrant, energized, innovative society that you have in the United States of America without preserving not only the landscapes, but the, but the, but the long-established cultural traditions of engagement with those landscapes that have been so forceful in creating the American character. Yeah, and it comes back to what you said for me. It's it's that food I'm able to acquire when I'm out. It's there. a huge part of it, you know. And after all, you are part elk. I am part <laughs> moose and seal and everything else. And that's 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 what we are. Yeah. Yeah. And a few carrots and stuff like that. <laughs> I did eat my greens. My, my wife has been down at the farmer's market and getting some of these great July cucumbers, which... Yeah, oh, no, I, I, I get my greens. That's good. You got to do that. You got to live up to the primate in yourself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the dangers of using numbers, Shane, is are the numbers that you have well supported, yeah. well researched, because any critic goes to the you know, World Wide Web to find something. And one thing I have often struggled with when I've tried to find total hunter numbers in the yeah. United States, we, we don't really have a good source of that. Yeah. So when you start talking about these economic numbers, is there, is there a way or a place that those can be as reliable as you'd like them to be? Well, first of all, there, there are a lot of numbers out there, that's for sure, as you've, as you've mentioned. And 
um, a lot of the numbers that are generated um, are generated through surveys where ultimately the final numbers that are provided are based on a sample. Yeah. And, um, and sample sizes and, and work conducted in that way always lead to what we call confidence intervals, which is the variance you know, around the, the average. Yeah. And um, that means that when you talk about numbers, you have a number they give you, let's say it's 100, but the actual number statistically might vary anywhere from 80 to 120, let's yeah. say. And that's true of a lot of the estimates that we have. We're dealing with this now in a major review of recreational fishing in Canada, where we had to go back behind the scenes and actually get the metadata, the actual raw data, to be able to run our own analyses to come up to find out what the truth and the numbers are. And then that's one problem. And most people only report, of course, that average value mm -hmm. and don't provide information about how far it might range to the up, upper or lower levels. Um, the second thing is, of course, that um, these basic uh, statistics, which may be compiled by a very reputable organization, let's say by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or a group like that, or the National Shooting Sports uh, you know, Foundation efforts, um, and then bits and pieces of that information are taken and often published in, uh, you know, in, in relatively uh, popular literature, yep. in magazine literatures, for example, yep. or, you know, put on the web for distribution through social media, and those, of course, are very often provided without real detailed explanations of context, because to provide it, it just destroys the kind of nature of that easy yep. read. So. There's a series of layers of, of essential problems with the data. It doesn't mean the data is wrong, but it certainly means that we are in desperate need of having something that is going to become accepted as sort of, of the standard mm -hmm. with an explanation as to why it is a standard. Conservation Visions believes that this is absolutely critical to have this in, in, in a marriage with uh, you know, the information that is coming out of the Wild Harvest Initiative itself, because many of these numbers are, are linked. You know, how many hunters you have, therefore, right. and how much meat do they share, how many licenses do they buy, and, and all of these kinds of things. And also, as we're looking forward to what the future might hold, and we look at the question of the numbers of hunters we have in the country per capita, for example, uh, and we look at the trends in those numbers, we have to be certain that the the, the values on the trends are the same values in each case. In other words, we have reliable data at right. each point to develop the lines. And furthermore, we have to know um, the community we're dealing with in terms of its demography, because as I pointed out, the largest problem, the biggest problem, the single biggest problem for hunting in the United States and Canada, which is largely not emphasized nearly as much as the numbers of hunters, you know, they're going down, right. is actually the, the, the life history makeup, of, if you will, of the population of hunters, where we have seen a massive shift in the last 15 years or so from most of our hunters being in cohorts that run from the ages of maybe 25 to 45. Now most of the hunters that we have are running in the cohorts of, you know, 45 to 65 or 70. Yeah. And we know that at about the age of 70 or so, for most people, it starts to fall off. Um, a combination of things which warrants its own studies, in fact, combination of things, which is physicality, just whether, you know, for certain hunts, a person is able to do it anymore, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and, um, and then there is the issue of uh, the psychological aspect. Do I want to do it anymore? Mm -hmm. And as surprising as it may sound to many young hunters out there, there is a well-recognized phenomenon that, um, you know, as, as hunters age, uh, and particularly as they get towards, you know, the the, the late 50s, 60s, 70s, and, and older kind of age brackets, they tend to lose interest not in the idea of hunting, but they tend to lose interest often in the idea of taking a life. Hmm. Life becomes more sacred to them, all lives. And I think that's a beautiful thing. I don't think it's something, wow. uh, it's, it, it's a natural thing. I think it's a beautiful thing. I think it's something to be celebrated. But of course, as we look to the future of hunting and we see that more and more people are entering this age bracket, it's not only that we 
have a problem of not recruiting new hunters. It's also that many of the hunters that we still have in the system increasingly will become less inclined to actually hunt, even though they will identify themselves as hunters right. and were hunters all their lives. Hmm. So Conservation <clears throat> Divisions is very interested in setting up standard uh, metrics, standard statistics that are based on the behind-the-scenes raw data for these many ver surveys that have been conducted over time, and having that as another component of our database and as another uh, support, if you will, for the conclusions that we will make uh, out of the Wild Harvest Initiative itself. You know, as a scientist, I am not prepared to rush anything in the Wild Harvest Initiative to come out with numbers that will then later be proven to have been in, 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 inaccurate, false, um, you know, or, or in some cases even potentially diametrically opposed to the truth yeah. the, of the reality of what's going on. And so this takes a great deal of verification, but it also takes a great deal of investigation of the information that's out there to say, well, how did they derive their estimates of numbers of hunters, as you pointed out, right. and things of this nature? So the... Uh, the numeric, uh, the numeric landscape uh, into which the issues of jobs and economic outputs and uh, wildlife numbers and the amount of food we could possibly harvest, all those kinds of things, of course, are totally interrelated. You could have wonderful landscapes, incredibly abundant wildlife, and no hunters and fishermen interested in taking it. That is a scenario that could happen. Yeah. You could have a situation where you don't have many hunters and anglers, and therefore, as a result of that, somebody else gets the idea, well, the best thing for us to do, because there's not enough of the average hunters going out and doing it, well, we'll, we'll form some sort of elite core of, of snipers, and they'll just go out and they'll shoot it all, and then they'll put it in the marketplace for us. I mean, there are many scenarios right. that you can imagine here. Um, and not all of which are going to make everybody happy, for sure. Yeah. Um, and I think we should be striving to do the best we can with the system we have right now. Yeah. A lot of that gets down to the best information and the best numbers. It does. It does. So we're, we're working hard on that as another major component, actually, of this program now. Yeah. And we're looking to expand that tremendously if we can find the support and the resources to do it. I'm, I'm thinking about these numbers about the, the amount of funding, whether it's you know, license fees, taxes, donations of time and money that come disproportionately from the hunting and angling community. Mm -hmm. Do you think the, the rest of, if you want to call it the, the greater society as a whole, do you think they understand that? They, they appreciate it? Have we done a bad job of communicating I, I, that? I think there's a large percentage of people in uh, American society who do not understand uh, just the disproportionality of funding for conservation, particularly for you know what we call game or large species. But mm -hmm. let's face it: when we talk about these game species, which has become you know sometimes a slightly pejorative word, you know you shouldn't talk right. about game species. We're interested in other wildlife. The point of fact and truth is that if you ask most American children, most American adults today to name a wildlife species, and they live anywhere, they live in LA or they, they live in Oregon or they, they, uh, you know, they, live in, uh, they live in Washington or they live in, in, in uh, somewhere in Louisiana, it doesn't matter. If you ask most of them to name a wildlife species, you know, they're going to name some of the common, iconic species, which also happen to be game species. Mm -hmm. They're going to name bison, they're going to name elk, they're going to name deer, they're going to name, you know, bears and turkeys and things of this nature. Um, but I don't think that most of them understand where the money comes from. And um, I don't think they therefore think about, well, what would happen if that money went away? Mm -hmm. And in the scenario of the money going away, of course, we assume, as hunters and anglers, would be that we go away. We're no longer there, and we're therefore not making the payments. Now, as you also know, there's a portion of society that is informed and is critical of the fact that they believe state agencies sometimes pay too much attention to hunters and anglers because that's where the money comes mm -hmm. from. That may have some legitimacy in some places. Mm -hmm. the, we, cannot, uh, we cannot deny that. It will be a natural tendency to pay a lot of attention to the people who pay the freight. 
Yeah. <laughs> if you were a train conductor, that's you know kind of how it would work. <laughs> yeah. And so it's believable that that can, in fact, be the case. However, I point out just how much diversity of program there is in the state agencies and has been in the state agencies, even to the point of developing non-game programs specifically for other species right. as far back as 20 and 30 years ago. But I do think that there is... Um, there is the question uh, of where the money would come from uh, if the hunting and angling community went away. There is also the question of, it, 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 depending on where that other money did come from, if it came, how that would change our perceptions of what we want and expect from wildlife and from the landscapes that are mm -hmm. out there. That could profoundly change as well because of the different motivations of people. Now, we are about to see, hopefully, one of the great new inventions in American conservation, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, which will find ways of uh, finding money uh, that will be put into wildlife conservation and primarily for species that are not currently provided for primarily through the funds that are raised by hunters and anglers. And um, this will provide a massive and ongoing new infusion of money to state agencies, which I think will be a very positive thing from a number of reasons, for, from a number of perspectives. Number one, there'll be more money to do good work. Right. Number two, the constituencies that may have felt they were not seeing their wildlife, or their wildlife interests followed up on, will mm -hmm. probably see that that's being done to a much, much greater extent. And uh, hopefully this can lead to a a more, a, a, an even more broad-based kind of approach to conservation by by the state agencies. But let's, for the moment, just think about the fact that since before, but certainly after the 1930s and up until the 2022s of our current time period, <laughs> today, you know, there has been a group of people in society who have hunted and fished, et cetera, who are consumptive users, sustainable users of the wildlife resource, who have provided disproportionate amounts of money for conservation because in addition to the excise taxes and the hunting permits they, they purchased and all of those kinds of things, uh, they too uh, pay general taxes. Right. And so wherever there was a small amount of general taxation provided to support conservation, in there, the hunter and angler dollar also fl fluttered around and played itself out. Yeah. As someone who has spent probably a disproportionate share of my discretionary income and certainly a disproportionate share of my, uh, you know, if we all say time is our most valuable resource, uh, like a lot of my fellow hunters and anglers, uh, I've invested heavily of my time and money mm -hmm. in these nonprofit, non-governmental organizations. And you've mentioned how that kind of originated here in the United States and is somewhat unique. Yep. Uh, do you think we give enough credit to what the, I always call it the three T's, your time, your talent, or your treasure mm. that people give. Do, do you think we've we've properly given that it's it's credit? I think the people that are close to the NGO communities and have spent a significant amount of time in volunteer activity or participating in support of those organizations, I think that community of people understand it fairly well. Sometimes they feel frustrated by the fact that others don't understand right. it uh, you know, better. But I still think there are a lot of people who you know, society is a complex little nest, you know, and there's uh, there's all these little denizens that, that live in there. I mean, you got the birds that live in there, but the ticks that live on the birds are there, and the fleas that live on the birds are there, and you got a few worms and a few other things in there. It's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a soup bowl uh, society, and you can't really expect everybody to right. be aware of all the things that are going on, and uh, people have priorities. Some people are more concerned about human health or... Right you know, food security itself you know, or something, whatever, education, whatever it might be. Um, but I do think it would be very helpful. Uh, and I, this is an, <laughs> such an old argument. I, I must have abandoned this argument with the hunting community maybe 20 years ago because it was just going nowhere. I do believe that we should have always been doing a much better job of communicating exactly how 
wildlife is managed and conserved in this country. It has been an amazing thing to me to see how little many American citizens know of how it actually works. In yeah. Canada, it's much simpler. The government pays for it. Well, that's, you know, okay, who, who pays for it? Manitoba, the government. Who oh. pays for it? Prince, you know, Prince Edward Island, the government pays for it, and so on. But here it is much, 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 much more complicated, and the mm. hunting and angling community are directly invested. I've never understood why there hasn't been just a regular mechanism and vehicle, why that history and story has not been repeatedly told to the American public in school education systems, uh, in training sessions for people who were interested in the outdoors, in academic programs where people were trying to understand how to manage wildlife. I mean, it's amazing. I talk to a lot of graduate students, and, you know, there are some that are informed about this. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, if their graduate interest might be, I don't know, uh, tiny little frogs, which are beautiful little animals, I used to keep a lot of them, uh, you know, they may not be so likely to understand or even question where does the funding come in support yeah. of this animal. And yet the programs of state agencies are responsible for all those wildlife species and their habitat programs that they generate and that they help support, support all of those wildlife species. So even at the academic level and even at the at the uh, graduate student level and so on, including undergraduate, but certainly at the graduate student level, you might expect some, a little he heightened awareness. There generally is not nearly as good, and in some cases there is an abysmal understanding of exactly how wildlife is funded in the United States of America. And if you travel oh. abroad, uh, you know, and go and, and start to talk about our model in other regions of the world, other continents of the world, well, of course, you know, the the, 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 the 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 diameter of the braid of knowledge, you know, just just goes down to the width of a hair, yeah. and eventually breaks, and there's really no knowledge transfer there at all. Yeah. So the short answer to this question is, I don't think that enough people know, and I think it would be, be far better off if a lot more people knew. And we have certainly plenty of money in various organizations I could name who could be getting this story out there, who, in my view, have just never done it. Yeah. Well, there's the old saying that if you don't tell your story, no one else will. No, it's going to be a slightly different story. <laughs> yes, so, I totally agree. I, I, I think when yeah. it comes to our nonprofit groups and the, and the value that they provide through volunteerism, through advocacy, it'd be great to quantify that someday. Oh, well, and, stick around. <laughs> Stick around. <laughs> it's all coming. Oh, Shane. Why did I? Uh, I almost, I, I'm thinking about saying that. I'm thinking, I might be setting myself up here by saying, we should do that. Somebody should do that. And I oh, saw you get this smug smile and say, Stick around. <laughs> I totally agree with you. Uh, uh, no question. I've done a lot of research to try to put these numbers together, Shane, as I've built, you know, a business plan for what I'm doing, uh, yeah. trying to analyze where is all this, where is it happening, what numbers, is it hunting, is it fishing, and this is a little bit dated information, but as best as I could come up with about five or six years ago, uh, hunting and, and fishing combined, the retail activity and not counting everything else, was about almost at that time $70 billion of expenditures. Mm -hmm. uh, and the employment of jobs was about 480 some thousand jobs in the United States. We're just talking the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, but those are probably five or six year old numbers, uh, a little yep. bit dated. And I. I, I, I'm a little hesitant to use them because there's just so much other economic value that yes. how, how do you capture, okay, the person, you know, when they stopped at the gas station and they get bought the coffee in the, in the tank yep. full of gas or the, you know, had to get new tires on my truck or whatever it might be. Yep. So yep. I'm sure there's people who have formulas for how that works, but I'm not smart enough. Well, you know, there's lots of uh, economic models that judge expenditures on a lot of sectors in the economy. I think, I think it suffice it to say that when you have something that's um, even at a superficial level estimated to be generating, in fact, expending 
uh, you know, up to 63 to $70 billion annually uh, of activity. Uh, it, you know, it, it doesn't take, a, a, you know, a, a, an Einstein to figure out that if you throw that amount of money into a working community of human beings, that that gets chewed up and passed on and generated and utilized in many different ways yeah. to go far beyond that original $70 billion or whatever it might be. Yeah. But even at that scale, you know, $70 billion of expenditure, or you might look upon it the other way and say you owned a corporation and you were actually getting $70 billion of revenue, revenue. each year, um, you would clearly be uh, the CEO of one of the absolute major uh, corporations in all of America and probably one of the richer ones in the entire world, yeah. all generated uh, by relatively small numbers of individual expenditures by the individual hunters and anglers themselves in pursuing their, you know, their local tradition, perhaps close to home in the right. river nearby, or maybe sometimes taking a trip to uh, to move more distantly. And I think that the um, the spillover effect of these uh, of these activities is also not fully appreciated. When people become critical of the activity, they tend to think of two components, the animal that is being killed and the hunter who is actually doing it. Mm -hmm. But they don't think about the much wider group of apes, uh, you know, who benefit from this because they own small coffee shops and they own small bait shops and they own small motels and they, yeah. they own small garages where they fix cars or sell tires or whatever uh, this might be. And... The viability of small communities, you know, I, I come from a circumstance where, 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 where that reality is pressed upon your, your conscious every single day. Mm -hmm. It is not easy to maintain uh, very small human uh, communities, um, particularly in the long term, because young people born into them want more and they want to move out of those communities. And that's generally the end of them. Yeah. Um, and the only way to provide circumstances where young men and women, you know, who, who, who get together and want to have children, have any hope of, uh, of surviving, even if they love the area, they love the quiet, they love the safety, they, they love the beauty of the area, they love the fact that their parents are there and their grandparents are there and so on. They still must have an economic anchor and an economic reality to be able to keep them there. Yeah. And over the course of the last uh, century, these uh, rural traditions, and they were primarily born in rural traditions of hunting and angling, have provided just absolutely countless opportunities to help maintain communities, to help build families, to help allow people to stay in places where they would have loved to have stayed. All of this subtlety, all of this, all of this color in the tapestry of, of hunting, which is so often presented in black and white, is, 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 is lost. And it's lost far too often. And, of course, it really requires that we will begin to explain it with a new series of stories around wild harvesting, around One Health, and around these kinds of ideas that unite the natural world and the health of the natural world with the health of wildlife and the health of human beings and the health of um, human communities. So I think the we have a lot more stories to tell. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the greatest capacity we've ever had to tell them because of social media and, and, and other platforms. Um, and now we're soon going to have a brand new, you know, brand new mountains, mountain ranges of data, in a sense, that are going to absolutely, when they're erected and placed before the public, it's just simply going to change the way they see the landscape of hunting and angling. Yeah. And as I was listening to you talk to, to these rural places, I grew up in a town of 500 people. Yep. And it was a little logging community, and mom owned the only diner. Yep. The only real. That was a consistent, regular yep. hours of business that yep. employed people. And there was this pulse. Fishing season would start in May, and yep. she would be really busy. Yep. And in the summer, as the dog days of August came, the yep. fishing wound down. And then came grouse season and yep. another big pulse of yep. busyness in her little business. And yep. then came whitetail deer season, which were 16 days of her best, most profitable days of the year. Absolutely. And she'd be 
her and her crew would be completely exhausted. Me and my siblings would be mm -hmm. whatever spare help she could get us, yeah. the washing dishes and whatever. Yeah. But she viewed that as her harvest season, the, yeah. these pulses. And, and may, people may say, well, that's, that wasn't a big amount of money. When you are operating on thin margins, when you small businesses struggling and along comes a really robust act, series of activity, mm -hmm. it is very meaningful. And yeah. I don't know how we measure that. But. Well, I mean, I think this is the problem with macroeconomic theories and applications. Um, you know, to say, for example, that in a case like, even in a place like Africa, international hunting only generates, you know, two or three percent of the GDP or whatever it might be, or we could make the same statement here. That's not the way to look at that money. Money has place. All money has place. And this money has a very particular place. And where that money lands in the particular places it does land, it has a big impact. Yeah. Newfoundland sealers didn't make very much money by the standard of people in the world elsewhere by undertaking this ridiculously hard and dangerous task upon themselves. Um, but when they weren't making anything at all, even 40 or $50 was something that was extremely meaningful to them. Yeah. And this comes back, of course, by way of analogy, this comment on economics, it's analogous to the point we've been making about food, isn't it? The amount of food that is harvested by uh, hunters and anglers and other foragers in society is not, you know, making a major dent in the overall food economy, perhaps, of the United States of America or Canada. But for the communities in which it is an important part, it is a vital part. It is. And we should not be in a position to do anything to jeopardize that vital part because for some reason people think it's not all that important to the larger metric of a country. Yeah. That, that's not how you build a country. No. Uh, and It's not how you build an economy either yeah. because if it goes away, it's highly unlikely that this larger amount of money owned essentially by, say, a national government or the, the, the lead government is all of a sudden going to say, well, you know what, uh, we really need to take that X percentage and put it directly into, you know, these, these uh, 35 rural communities we have, which currently have a, a very low rate of, uh, of economic activity. Yeah. They have to have something that generates it for themselves, for their pride, for their culture, for the you know, to give them a sense of identity and purpose and so on and so forth. And, you know, these activities have given them that for a long period of time. Yeah. It's no sideshow. No, uh, it's not to me. No. And, and to probably most others who are benefiting from it. Yeah. One of the dangers of talking with an accountant, Shane, is I put everything in terms of numbers. Yeah. Good. But... <laughs> He, you and so many others in my own life experiences show me that there are so many values of this activity we call wild harvest that probably is getting missed in these really precise economic calculations. But, you know, economists and accountants, that's, that's kind of what we do. Mm -hmm. But we also don't like it when we're told our, our story or our math is incomplete. Mm-hmm. Something tells me that you would maybe say, let me paint a, a more complete picture. Well, I, yes, I, I would like to paint a more complete picture. I mean, we've emphasized part of that more complete picture many times with the very focus that we have on this wild harvest that we've never really included the idea of the value of the food. Right. So this to me is is a, just a, a highly conspicuous problem that needs to be addressed. I mean, we should have always been thinking about this. We weren't. Well, now we have a chance to sort of address it. But we also have to think about, you know, what happens if these activities go away and we get into this scenario of what are the replacement costs. I mean, you think about what it's going to cost to generate this amount of food and transport it again, to get it from places of, of production to places where it matters, i.e. into those same homes, communities, and families mm -hmm. of the people we are talking about who benefit from, from this harvest, these wild harvesting activities today. 
And we have to think about what it is going to take to create that. It's not just the land. It's also the fuel that must be consumed in some way or another to actually produce the livestock or produce the f fruits mm -hmm. and vegetables. It's the wildlife land that we talked about before that is lost as a result of having to create more of this agricultural kind of land. There's also the loss of talents, the loss of... Um, many cultural aspects that attend the issues of, of hunting and, and fishing and all of that kind of harvesting, you know, the best perhaps understood in the deer camp ideal, you know, with the open yeah. fire and the people talking about it in the evening and hunting in the daytime and coming back and telling their experiences that, you know, young boys hear about and young girls and then eventually 20 years from now, they're the people who are running the show and there's other little ones who are listening to all of this. You know, the things that are lost and the things that are kind of shredded um, uh, as a result of this kind of displacement of a cultural icon in a country, such as, you know, the sustainable use of wildlife has been in the United States of America and in Canada, uh, these are real costs. And someone has to bring forward these costs. So one of the things when we get into this component of the Wild Harvest Initiative where we are talking about replacement cost, if it all goes away, what happens? Mm -hmm. We're not just going to be talking about, say, the kinds of numbers that an accountant would want, to, <laughs> would want to hear. We will talk about those, but we will also talk about a lot of things that are about values and ethics and traditions and sort of cultural supports that uh, make the difference between having a country that can have you know, many diverse sort of rural experiences and cultures uh, versus a country that can have very few of them or perhaps none at all. The real identity of America, just like the real identity of Canada or anywhere else in uh, any particular part of those countries, there is an urban identity, of course, in major centers. These are mm -hmm. big places where you can go see plays and you can go see museums and art galleries and all that kind of stuff. But if you really want to understand how people think and why they think the way they do and why they have the values they do in a particular state or a particular region, you ultimately need to be able to have contact with people in the rural communities. If those rural communities are not viable, and they don't offer circumstances that are amenable to good lives for the people who live there, then you lose them. And with them, you lose all of those intangibles that together help make a country what it is. Yeah. Do you think we consider properly what the environmental impacts would be if we tried to replace the wild harvest with other forms of, of no, food. I mean, we we kind of touched on that, but I, I'm trying to think of it just in, th this is a sustainable system that is out there. If we, you know, using your thing of let's pretend it doesn't exist. Yep. People are still needing those f items of food, that nutrition. They are. I can't imagine that it's, well, I can only imagine that it would add a significant impact or well, there will be. A, there's, there's no question there will be a significant impact. I mean, we we have to do it at such scale that that uh, th there's there's no doubt that we would have measurable impact in terms of increase in many of the problems that we face with industrial agriculture and production now, yeah. from runoff to increased water usage to methane production to you know the collection of, of massive pools of feces and what to do with them and purification systems and insecticides and herbicides and you know the fuel for harvesting it and collecting it and transporting it and moving it around the globe all at a time when you know the burning of fossil fuels for many people at least is something that we should be trying to make some measure of right. of, of 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 reducing so no i think this is a, again comes back to a matter of scale we are not saying that when we finish this Wild Harvest Initiative, we'll be saying, look, this amounts to one half of all the food that Americans eat. We will be right. saying it's a large amount of food. It's vitally important to the people who are involved in it. It has a network of friends and colleagues who take advantage of this as well and who benefit from it. It's a vital part of the home food economy for, for millions of, of Americans and Canadians. And in that sense, it is something very wor worthwhile preserving. 
And if it goes away, here's the cascade of effects that the country is going to have to deal with. The loss of income for conservation that is going to have to re be replaced with or without RAWA. The last thing you want to do is bring in a new funding mechanism, then see your old funding mechanisms all with it. You know, it's a pretty yeah. frustrating circumstance. Um, and that you're going to also lose this idea of incentivized conservation where people argue for and, 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 uh, and lament the loss of conservation opportunities and of wildlife and landscapes themselves. Um, there is an awful lot at stake here. And part of what we want to do in the communications aspect of the Wild Harvest Initiative is to begin to remind people of exactly what is at stake here. And we need a lot of help from the NGOs and the business organizations and so on who are involved in this space to get this message out and to get it out seriously. Yeah. Because in the end, we will all lose if these things go away. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we all have nothing but benefit by telling that story. Yes, I totally agree. Absolutely. This is where some of my maybe personal biases come in, but it, I, I guess if you have life experiences, you're going to have personal biases. Sure you can. I, I grew up... On this show. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're in charge, so we can be as biased as we want, right? Uh, I grew up in this little logging town. You know, my father was a logger. All my uncles were loggers. My brother is still a logger. And I was immersed in that, and I got to see the benefits that very often happen through disrupting landscapes, regenerating new growth. All of a sudden, boy, there's a lot of rabbits, there's a lot of deer, there's a lot of grouse. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I look at some of the things that are happening on our bigger landscapes. I'll use the Western United States, for example. And we have as a society wanted our piece of paradise next to the mountains, uh, up against the forest or within the forest. And so we suppress fires that were such mm -hmm. a natural part of our yep. systems. And I've often thought, well, we know this isn't good for wildlife. We know it's not good for the forest itself or the landscape. What's the mechanism or what's the alternative if, if we uh, decided that we we're going to suppress all these fires, but yet we, we want elk and we want deer and we want rabbits and we want songbirds. And so I've often, and I've pitched this to a couple of our elected leaders that we should hire loggers to come in as actual managers or, or as a service, a, a contractor to improve the landscape mm -hmm. and benefit conservation. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe I'm looking at that askew because I come from the logging background and I understand the benefits of thinning and, and you know, well done logging. Mm -hmm. Am I, are there other places out there, other ways that uh, we could be thinking about how we could incentivize and use some of the, the things we view as problems as ways to improve the landscapes and conservation? Well, I mean, that's a, pretty wide open question I mean, oh, yeah. all the way from, you know, being able to take, um, you know, a problem like um, manure ponds, for example, uh, outside of large pig farms and being able to find ways to actually turn that into methane gas, which can actually be used to drive vehicles or farm machinery or things of this nature. So, you know, we already have templates and people working on that kind of thing. We now see uh, opportunities opening up where people who are true capitalist investors who want to take big capital and invest in landscapes and restore them to their historic um, species guilds and so on and so forth, planting, um, planting the native grasses and using those circumstances to uh, sequester carbon because the grasses are fantastic carbon sequesters just like as trees are. Uh, and return those lands essentially to pristine conditions because the world is changing. And now there are emerging markets for these kinds of landscapes that are, that are sequestering carbon and that are dominated by native species and that are places of abundant wildlife and where people of relative wealth can, of course, uh, buy homes and uh, build homes and say that they have 
um, essentially a piece of paradise. Now, of course, there will be people who will say, well, that's not too bad because only certain kinds of people will be able to buy those kinds of things. But it's an example of taking a problem where we have allowed land to deteriorate Mm -hmm. or developed it for agriculture or other purposes at a breakneck speed without thinking about what the long-term complications were, and now we suddenly see incentives in society to actually reverse that trend and to do so in a way that does not require philanthropy and does not require government money per se, but actually is worth the economic investment by individual entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. This is a major phenomenon, which I'll be speaking about next week, and it's a very exciting exciting new development. Um, So I think, yes, we see lots of examples of where uh, we can still do a better job and where there is reason to be optimistic that we will do a better job and where the idea of sustainably managing wildlife, taking wildlife as a focus of the land use practice, the ultimate expression of proper land use practice and intensively managing for sustainable harvest wildlife populations is becoming particularly on private lands, and more and more and more attractive kind of business operation for people. And somehow or other, we have to move away from expecting philanthropy to pay for all of conservation, and we have to get to a point where conservation is integrated in our broader economies in ways that are self-perpetuating. And I think we're beginning to see, you know, this, uh, this actually happening. And again, this whole idea of what story ultimately will we tell when we finish with this wild harvest initiative. We will be talking about all of these things. Yeah. We'll be talking about human health. We'll be talking about new visions for, for landscapes and visions that are not just idealistic, visions that include ways in which people can actually make money by investing in these landscapes, where we can solve some of our climate change problems by investing in these landscapes, where we can provide for you know, better foods for lots of people, where we can uplift the diversity and the abundance of wildlife on these landscapes, even for people who simply want to see them, you know, to watch them through binoculars yeah. and spotting scopes and so on, um, and to essentially create you know, aesthetic landscapes where people feel comfortable, where the water is clean and the air is fresh and, and wildlife is thriving. These are all components of this, of this wild harvest initiative. And, and we are, as I've said several times, we are already seeing components well outside of this project. You know, I didn't create the, the circumstances where it is now becoming profitable for people to invest in landscapes in this way for carbon sequestration or returning native right. species. I had nothing to do with that. But I recognize it as, as sort of one of the moons that, you know, will circulate around this sort of this sort of planet of of wild harvesting as we think about all of the many, many, many benefits that come about if we start to revolutionize our thinking and look at these landscapes as health-providing, food-providing systems for wildlife, for people, and for landscapes. I think this will be a quantum leap forward for mankind, frankly, and for the biodiversity of the planet. Yeah. Do you, do you think that our North American model that we oftentimes fall back to has maybe some... Challenges where it prevents us from experimenting with certain things. And um, the example I always think about is the American alligator. It is one of the exceptions of no commercial markets. But most people would say that the American alligator was close to seeing its its end on this continent Mm -hmm. in the 60s and 70s. And somehow, and I'm not privy to how, there was an allowed exception to what are kind of the tenets of our North American model that prohibit the commercial markets. And now they give out tags and they have a certain amount of commercial harvest of this wild resource that are American alligators, Mm. the hides and the meat. Mm. And now we have more alligators than anyone could have ever dreamed of. And so the, the the wild harvest itself kind of paid its way and, and stood up in the economic arguments and the arguments of nuisance and all the other concerns. And now we have all kinds of alligators. But that's true for all these species. 
Do you think so? Yeah, the economic investment that was made to, you know, to recover um, the species like elk and, and whitetails and so on so that they could be harvested. I mean, economies can mean many things. An economy can mean you take an animal, you kill an animal, you butcher an animal, and mm-hmm. I sell it to Randy. Right. An economy can mean Randy, by virtue of the fact that he wants to harvest the animal, he pays someone, government in this particular case, a certain mm-hmm. amount of money, uh, but money transfers hands for him to have the opportunity, not right. the guarantee, the opportunity to harvest. In the case of the American alligator, of course, what's happened is that there have been, you know, um, programs put in place where you can harvest a certain percentage of wild eggs from wild alligator nests, and we can actually raise these kind of in alligator farms, and we can, you know, actually sell them because they're coming out of those kinds of mm-hmm. those kinds of spaces. Um, I do think, though, that. You know, when we finish this wild harvest initiative, a lot of people are going to say um, it's going to be another impetus to think about this whole idea of what economics around wildlife means. Yeah. Whether we should consider, for example, for superabundant species like wild hogs, wild hogs, and and snow geese, and potentially Canada geese and others whether we shouldn't be harvesting them, particularly in certain areas where they have reached. Let's call it nuisance proportions or whatever. Yeah. Uh, that we'd be able to harvest them and actually provide that high quality food under good inspection services, which is a challenge, to get it out to people who most desperately need it, or if there's enough, to give it to people who just simply might want it. So I don't have any doubt that you you, you know you cannot contain a revolution like a, a small little at home experiment in building a rocket ship, you know, when they send kids at home and they mix a few things and poof, you know, the little rocket blast off the table. You, you can't, you're not going to be able to control the full implications of what's coming out of this yeah. massive piece of work. No, I had- People will see different things in it, different opportunities in it for themselves. And one that we can certainly predict is that there will be a return to some consideration of the old, now long prevented uh, activity in Canada, the United States, Will we ever think about selling the meat of wildlife in a commercial way? Um, And the arguments are many for and against. The circumstances have vastly changed since when we brought in those prohibitions at the time we did. Mm -hmm. When wildlife was being decimated, we had no good enforcement practices. Our science was poor. Uh, You know, all of those kinds of things are vastly different than it is today. Uh, And we have, as you point out with the alligator, we have toyed around the edges with ways, you know, we can do this without actually going out, killing them and marketing them uh, directly. So I do think, um, I do think that we are, uh, if, Randy, we can find the resources, we will finish all of the basic analytic data and provide the information that is so well on track that it's it's an inevitability. Mm-hmm. But whether we can find, of course, the resources that are going to be necessary to mobilize this at a scale that is going to be necessary to convince people of all the things that we have talked about yeah. in the last uh, two days uh, and to make the difference for policymakers and legislators – that remains still a critical question. I can only do so much with that. Yeah. That ultimately depends on how generous the communities of interest are going to be in trying to move this forward. Yeah, generous with finances, but also with their ability to get that word out. Absolutely. To use their influence, to use their networks and their connections. Because yeah. a lot of times that's worth as much as... I mean, it's still <laughs> yeah. you got to got to pay the bills. But, yeah. Yeah. No, uh, you, you need know. both. You need both. You yeah. you need you need raw money to do certain things in a business, and you need other kinds of advantages to make it work. And it cannot work with just one or the other. Yeah. And so we've been very fortunate so far. We built a major community of interest with this. We have absolutely fantastic sponsors and players. The list is continuing to grow. We have some of the biggest players in industry, you know, the Bass Pros and the Cabela Family Foundation and so on. We have some of the biggest uh, hunting NGOs. We have private philanthropists, as I've mentioned. We have state governments that are providing money. We have lots of uh, industry players from clothing companies like Sitka to, you know, Mystery Ranch with their backpacks and, and, you know, Sitka with their clothing, Leupold with their optics. I mean... 
you know, it, it has already attracted an enormous array of partners. Yeah. But I go from here to Texas uh, in another day's time to speak before a whole other array of interests and parties and institutions, um, uh, you know, that, um, that have themselves a great interest in this and who also in many cases have the wherewithal to join with this. So it'll be another step in trying to make sure that this becomes as big as it possibly can be. Remember, the North American model in the early 1990s, no one even knew it existed. And we took it and we put it into the mainstream thinking. And on this show alone, we've probably referenced it 50 times. Yeah. 25 years ago, 25 years ago, yeah. we would never have mentioned that term. Correct. No, so it I'm, can be done. Yeah. Well, your fingerprints are on both of those, so uh, I, they I'm are. confident. And, yeah. uh, but I want to make sure that the audience knows where they can find Shane Mahoney and Conservation Visions and the Wild Harvest Initiative. Yeah, well, they can simply Google me and find a slightly roundabout way to get to all of this. Uh, or they can uh, check into uh, conservationvisions, all one word, dot com, uh, or the wildharvestinitiative.com. And uh, they, they're all connected in a sense, of course, and they'll all reach us. And we have a big presence on Facebook that they can also uh, look for us there. And, of course, um, you yourself will be help to promote all of these ideas on your substantial platform. So that's another place they'll be able to find uh, they'll it be able, If anyone needs to know where to get a hold of Shane and all this amazing work, if you want to get a hold of me, I'll, uh, I won't give you a cell number, but uh, I'll make sure that they, they connect with you. Excellent. Thanks, Randy. Thank you, Shane.